Great, thank you very much. I want to welcome you all today to the Peter Tolley Coleman Lecture on Pacific Public Policy to be given today by President Pen David Penuelo of the Federated States of Micronesia. And what an honor it is to welcome you here to Georgetown University. My name is Alan Tidwell, and I'm the director of the Center for Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies. And this speech today is organized under the banner of the Blue Pacific Future which is a collaborative project between Georgetown University Center for Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Studies and the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii at um, uh, Manoa. So let me invite uh, Congresswoman Amanda Radawagon to introduce the president. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tidwell. Talofa, talofa lava. Talofa. Federated States of Micronesia faces challenges on many fronts, from COVID to climate change to competition between China and the United States. Leading FSM is President David Panuelo. He and other Pacific Island leaders are here in Washington to meet with President Biden for a two-day summit. President Panuelo has played a leading role in the region, backing efforts to repair the rift in the Pacific Islands Forum culminating this year in the Suva Agreement. He also penned a letter urging Pacific Island leaders to be wary of Chinese Foreign Minister <clears throat> Wang Yi's entreaties for Pacific Island countries to join Chinese-led security forum. Throughout, President Panuelo has demonstrated exceptional leadership, graciousness, and determination for the people of the Pacific. His Excellency, David W. Panuelo is the ninth president of the Federated States of Micronesia. Panuelo completed his early education on his home island of Pompeii and continued his education in the United States, earning his bachelor's degree in political science from Eastern Oregon University in 1987. After returning home, and he, he joined FSM's Foreign Service rising to Assistant Secretary for the Division of American and European Affairs. He also served overseas as Deputy Ambassador in both Fiji and at the United Nations in New York. Seeking to strengthen FSM's private sector, Panuelo left the public service and over seven years built various businesses in construction and human services, as well as creating the nonprofit Care Micronesia Foundation. On May 11, 2011, until May 11, 2019, President Panuelo served in the FSM Congress. On May 11, 2019, Panuelo was elected by the 21st FSM Congress to serve as the nation's ninth president. I give you President Panuelo. Uh, Congresswoman, you are too generous, you know. Every time I say uh, who I am and uh, what I am, I'm just a mere public servant to our citizens in our country. Uh, so thank you all. You know, this is an incredible honor to be here among all of you and then here at the Georgetown University. Uh, in our culture, I think when we come to a place for the first time, it rains because rain is a symbol of uh, uh, what you call plenty or a symbol of, uh, you know, the, the fact that, uh, you know, the bounty of our land and our uh, ocean is so, uh, so much of a blessing. But I think uh, I brought sunshine, you know, <laughs> to this uh, place. First of all, I, I would like to begin, of course, in our tradition to express my respects, of course, and uh, Greetings, uh, courtesies to uh, all of you. I want to begin with the Honorable uh, Amada Radawakan, Congresswoman for American Samoa uh, to the U.S. Congress. I also want to express uh, my respects to uh, John Tikoya, uh, President of Georgetown University, Dr. Alan uh, Tidwell, Director of the Center for Australian New Zealand and Pacific Studies at the Georgetown University Walsh School of Foreign Service, uh, and then all of you students who are here 
and then ladies and gentlemen who are here. I also uh, recognize uh, Fred Radewaken, who's been a, a good friend. Our delegation is here. Uh, we have our secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs, our secretary of Department of Justice, our ambassador to the United Nations, our press secretary, who's here, uh, who my missing chief of law from our Department of uh, Justice, uh, Richard Clark, former Peace Corps and about almost a citizen of Micronesia right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Tamara uh, from Canada was also friend working for our Micronesian uh, Conservation Trust. But what a pleasure to be here. And I know I have 20 minutes. I wish I could have more time than that because, you know, coming here at the Georgetown University, I know that many notables have walked the halls of Georgetown, you know, the likes of uh, President Clinton. I think he was a president when I was uh, a deputy firm rep at the United Nations. And we pumped into each other literally as I was looking for my president who was at the United Nations during the UNGA, like we just left. <clears throat> The likes of uh, Madeleine Albright, who uh, teaches here. Uh, these are uh, notables here. And Georgetown University with so much of history. As I walk here, I can feel, you know, all of that here. And then uh, it's amazing. I think you students uh, should not ever take it for granted. You know, the fact that this very institution of higher uh, learning, I believe, has inculcated in the tradition that you have here, a profound care and responsibility, which is your model that you have here. And I think that's very important. But on the lighter side, I was reading, I think you have deep traditions here at the university as well, right? And then uh, kind of reminded me of our historical ancient city of Nanmatol, which is a world heritage right now. Uh, I understand that uh, being here, you're not supposed to step on a mosaic seal that leads to the certain all because then uh, otherwise you will not graduate <laughs> like like our ancient city, right? <laughs> so those are the things that. But I, I went to a university at Eastern Oregon University as a small island going there. You know, I took a crayon bus to that school from Portland, which is the biggest city. And as I was going nearing there, maybe three hours or so drive or bus, right? Maybe four hours because we were uh, stopping on small in small towns. But when we reached the small town of La Grande, Eastern Oregon, I saw a sign that says, turn your clocks hundred years back. You know, you're, <laughs> you're arriving in the town of La Grande, 12,000 population. So try to picture yourself. But it is a special school. Uh, because it gives you the mindset to be in a place where you can go off and kind of commune with nature. Coming from the islands, it's not so much of a culture shock for me. It was uh, the first stepping stone to coming to the U.S. And then many years in my career, when I was posted to New York, <clears throat> I say, as a deputy perm rep, I had a second culture shock because, you know, what I was looking at was skyscrapers. I was only used to coconut palms, you know, in the islands that I come from. But I bring you warm greetings uh, from the paradise in our backyards, the Federated States of Micronesia. Of course, at the outset, I would like to uh, pay respects to the late Peter Talley Coleman, for whom this lecture series is named after, and his contributions uh, to his culture and his uh, land island. It's very important. Today, I just want to say before I launch into uh, my materials that I will share, I just want to share how important it is when you graduate like this institution here with graduates. And I know this school produce thousands of people that goes out in the countries, especially United States, to help in the nation building process. But imagine when our, uh, you know, students graduate and come back to a a population of only 100,000 or 120,000 people, a nation with 1 million square miles of ocean with 600 islands uh, dispersed. Uh, you know, the impact of even 20 graduates is huge in our nation, nation building process. So you can see the contributions at institutions like this and institutions like where I graduated 
and throughout the United States, the contribution it has in our nation building process. Just from my university, uh, aside from myself, we have a, a you know colleague of mine who's the president of our development bank, several of the graduates in our Congress of Micronesia, some who are now doctors. And so if you just uh, extrapolate that in the nation building, you'll see how amazing it is that you students, the future of your countries, that you will make a, an incredible impact, impact, positive impact. So don't ever take it for granted. I will speak briefly and in sequence on reflecting on matters concerning peace in our Pacific region. Finding a bad way forward for the Pacific Islands Forum and the FSM's campaign to protect our citizenry from the effects of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 now is a little bit more at ease, as you know. Uh, our country was one of the last uh, to have gotten uh, uh, a community spread. It came and spiked so fast, plateaued, but we were so prepared that uh, it, it fared pretty well in our country without losing lives of the few citizens that we have. And so thanks to the United States for the tremendous contribution. I want to say that the U.S. regards our country as part of the homeland, and we regard uh, ourselves as part of the homeland in the U.S. because of the special treaty that we have, which is called the Compact of the Association. <clears throat> But for some of you, if you're following, you know, the development in the Pacific region as students, you will know the, uh, the, the landscape of our blue Pacific continent, which is, uh, we termed it right now. But those of you who are new to it, the way I will paint it is here. You know, we have the conglomerate of our blue Pacific continent, which is comprised of the Micronesian subregion, the Polynesian subregion, and the Melanesian subregion. It's important to note that while I go through, uh, you know, what I wish to share with you. And then it's important to note that the Pacific Islands Forum is the premier political regional organization that we have among other organizations that are called the crop agencies or the sub, uh, you know, organizations that uh, feeds into the Pacific Islands Forum, which are, which is our premier regional organization. So after the onslaught of the uh, COVID, you know, the terrible COVID, which kept us uh, sort of locked down for the last two and a half years, uh, the marathon of our Talanoa or Pacific Way meeting in recent, say, last three months actually just started with the uh, Pacific Island Forum meeting, leaders meeting in Suva, at which time we uh, we adopted the, the forum communique. And then we came out where a Congresswoman joined our meeting in Honolulu of our second marathon of meetings, uh, 16 Pacific Island nations and territories gathered in uh, Honolulu at the East West Center uh, under the banner of the Pacific Island Conference of Leaders. After a long hiatus of uh, not meeting in person, we met again uh, the Pacific Island countries, and uh, we're working on the outcome of the meeting, which also emphasized what was brought from uh, Fiji and adopted by the leaders. And one of the documents that you'll hear in my discussions is the 2050 strategy for the blue Pacific continent. And I'll go through that a little bit. And then we were in New York, the Pacific Island countries for the UNGA, you know that the UNGA week in September is the busiest uh, month where leaders come together to really advocate the kind of issues that are important globally, you know, regionally, and then the Pacific came. And as Pacific Island countries, you might have been listening to our statements on the issues that are uh, most important to our communities, uh, uh, on top of which is climate change, you know, the issue of geopolitics, uh, human-centered development, and the list uh, goes on. <clears throat> and then we are now converging here at the capital of the United States at the invitation of uh, President Biden. Uh, uh, this is uh, going to be starting the 28th and 29th. Uh, it will be the first ever uh, U.S. Uh, Pacific Leaders uh, Summit. And, and so 
uh, you can see how important this meeting will be and we're it's fluid and we're coming together to uh, uh, really uh, uh, see ways of uh, working you with the U.S. as a major superpower in our Pacific region. I always say it's most harmonious and peaceful and we want to keep it that way. And so this meeting and the outcome of this meeting will be tremendous in my view. And uh, Federated States of Micronesia, including Palau and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, we have a very special relationship with the U.S. It's called the Compact of Free Association, which some of you are not following. It's so special that we serve in the U.S. Uh, military, in the U.S. Armed Forces, and in, we fight for the freedoms and the sacrifices and you know, uh, all of that. And we die for those kind of freedoms. And, and you know, we enlist our young men and women at the highest rate, more than any of the U.S. states that enlist uh, your own uh, citizens in the U.S. Armed Forces. And so it's special. And we're having negotiations with the U.S. Uh, we just concluded our third round in Honolulu uh, with the interagency team appointed by President Biden, Ambassador Yoon, who's a, a special envoy for the compact negotiations. And so being here is also important for our freely associated state nations, <clears throat> because then we will have bilaterals with the U.S to discuss uh, the dynamics of our ongoing negotiations. But I think it's important that I go through a few things because uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Radawak and uh, uh, express some of those issues that I, I need to touch so that it can elevate the discussion, your questions during the Q&A in asking me some frank questions that I actually enjoy uh, questions when <laughs> directed at me. And so in addressing the topic of security, uh, I propose the following, uh, you know, basic uh, questions. Given the recent security developments in the Pacific uh, region, what are the critical roles of the Federated States of Micronesia in the regional security landscape? That's one of the uh, broad questions. As head of state, uh, what must a responsible and diligent leader do to address maritime security and territorial integrity? What can the Pacific region do as a whole in order to address present security concerns? As a security partner of the Pacific region, what roles does the United States play in terms of regional security? You know, the hallmark of uh, FSM's uh, foreign policy uh, is that, you know, we are we are friends to all and an enemy to none. And also I'd like to say, growing up as a student like you, uh, as I was a student, I was reading our constitution to absorb some of it. And one of the beautiful parts of our constitution that I always uh, relay to people when I'm at the United Nations and here, uh, because you represent uh, uh, many uh, segments of the population of the US and maybe different countries, the, the uh, when, when uh, you know, we adopted our constitution of the Federated States of Micronesia in 1979, <clears throat> our founders, uh, you know, embedded in the language of the preamble of the constitution, something that I always say, and it's got a deep wisdom in it. And that's why I always say we extend to all peoples and nations what or that which we seek. And that is a peace, friendship, cooperation and love in our common humanity. You know, uh, as a father, as a leader, if you don't have the, the basic foundations of this as a country that you need to extend to other countries, then, then it'll be a difficult world to uh, live in, you know? Uh, and so I just wanna uh, share that with you. If you were following the developments in the Pacific, uh, Congresswoman uh, expressed that and, uh, or cited that I expressed concerns about the geo strategic competition in the Pacific, which is not in the best interest of the blue Pacific continent. Uh, and I said, we are a very harmonious and peaceful region. On, on 30th of March, 2022, I wrote to the prime minister of the Solomon Islands, who's a brother of mine. We meet and we really discuss the, the issues that are most important. And I expressed grave security concerns over the China Solomon Islands uh, uh, proposed security agreement, which was signed 
that both the United States and China are French to their FSM. You know, I say our foreign policy is, is, uh, is that. We cannot afford to be enemies to anybody. You can see the situation in Ukraine. Uh, how can we be enemies to anybody in a civilized world like today? So in light of the growing competition between the superpowers, future confrontation between major powers could thrust the FSM and the Pacific Island region as a whole to the epicenter of war. And we need not look far because we have uh, remnants of the whole Second World War around us in our waters, uh, on our land. Everything that reminds us of the, of the tragedy of the Second World War. So this happened uh, as the Pacific became the battleground of the Second World War. Uh, the ugly remnants of the war have uh, remained visible up to this day. And if you visit our islands, you will uh, still see tanks airplanes and ships from that time. As a matter of fact, there are ships that are sunken in the deep waters that are showing signs of oil leak leakage. And I would raise this to the directly from, to the Prime Minister of Japan when we had the Palm Summit with Japan and then with the US. We're trying to address that here uh, in the declaration that we're trying to adopt to see that there is an obligation that they need to be working with the Pacific Islands uh, on. And so many, many different issues that we have that we're working with. And then on, uh, on 28 May 2022, uh, Congresswoman mentioned the letter that I wrote to the leaders of the Pacific Islands Forum warning my colleague leaders that the Pacific could once again uh, be the collateral damage as we became stuck in the crossfire of the bigger countries who ought to be what I always term to be benevolent hegemons, you know, we welcome them in our countries, in our Pacific, but don't just be concerned about your superpower interest, you know, <laughs> your national interest. Be concerned about our issues because we're, we're countries without the military, you know, we only say, hey, you know, I, I say we extend to you uh, love and our common humanity, but you know, that the reality of the day is that every nation has interests, right? And the superpowers do pursue their interests. And so we desire peace, not war. And so coming to the United Nations, we also uh, launched uh, with our chairman of the Pacific Islands Forum, my good friend, uh, Frank Bainamarama, who is the prime minister of Fiji and current chair of our Pacific Islands Forum. I said, that's our premier regional political organization. The 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent is the roadmap, it's the foundation for the Pacific uh, countries and territories uh, to collectively support each other, especially during challenging times like the COVID, you know, challenging times when superpowers come in and their, their interests are not aligned with our interests, we have to stick together. Uh, uh, you know, a vital characteristic of the strategy is the dispute resolution in our own unique Pacific way uh, of reaching and building a consensus, respecting sovereignty and the principle of non-interference in our national affairs, because you know we are sovereign nations and we hope that we can uh, you know, resolve the disputes in a peaceful manner. Through the 50, 2050 strategy, uh, we become resilient and future ready by being able to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to challenges, including geopolitical and security trends and threats. The 2050 strategy is the bridge into the future. And we also appeal to our development partners like we advocated at the UN at the world stage to assist us in achieving our development objectives as nations with limited resources, not divide us in any way. <clears throat> Our strategy also reflects our obligations under international law. And I always say that we, every nation, independent, small or big, uh, to preserve the rules-based international order, that's very important because you know, that's what creates a dispute. If you don't respect the rules-based international order, you're going to encroach in somebody's territory. You're going to do some things that are not quite good, and that's what, that's what uh, really does create disputes that can cause, uh, you know, uh, major, major, uh, you know, a tragedy like like the Ukraine issue that we are facing. Respecting uh, uh, sovereignty, 
is why the FSM condemns the unprovoked attack against the people of Ukraine. I was going to one of our small islands uh, on a small plane like a nine-seater, and then news reached me that uh, as we were monitoring uh, Russia, that Russia invaded Ukraine. I reached uh, Yap and I called in all my you know, advisors and we reached out to Ambassador here and that fires were coming from every direction. And then they said, but your major power uh, uh, partner has not severed diplomatic relations with, uh, with uh, Russia. I said, I don't care. The right thing to do is sever diplomatic relations with Russia. And we did, you know, because how do you maintain diplomatic relations of a, a country that's uh, palming women, children, schools, and just decimating life? How do you, how do you even measure up to saying, hey, you know, we still enjoy diplomatic relations? And so I think it's very important when leaders take decisive action uh, uh, that reflects our values. And uh, in Micronesia, our values are, you know, respect uh, elderly, respect, you know, uh, families. You have to respect, and that has to be uh, uh, translated in how we do our conduct our, our own relations. So we condemn the attack because it is illegal, blatantly disregards international law and norms and undermines the UN Charter, whose very purpose is to maintain international peace and security. We sever diplomatic ties with Russia because we see as having shared purpose and value. The FSM can only reinstate diplomatic relations once Russia shows love in our common humanity. And you know, if you watch the news and follow, look at now, they're doing like fake uh, referendums, they're, they're doing, a, what's the word, constriction or a trap to to get the young people and they're fleeing the country. How do you do that when they, you're sending them to do an unjustified war? How do you justify something like that? How can a leader, autocrat, uh, be doing something like that? We absolutely have uh, a night and day if you look at the values. And I think the world need to continue to condemn Russia, but it's unfortunately it's not ending too soon. I wish it could because it is killing lives, children and women. So it is our moral duty and obligation as world leaders, world leaders to condemn the war and to make sure that it's concluded as soon as possible. Sometimes I get impatient when I'm in my I, you know, home watching the news and say, why can't the world stop this thing? You know, this uh, mad thing that's uh, killing this many people and winter is uh, around the corner. You know how that difficult it is with the uh, uh, men and women and children to be exposed to the cold and all of that. I know I have a very short time. I have a lot more to cover, but another vital characteristic of regional security is the cohesive fabric of our Pacific unity, uh, you know, under the Pacific Islands Forum. Uh, just recently, you know, I, I, I always say when I pick up and, you know, the wisdom from people, I, I say here and I stand here, was it Dr. Maya? How do you pronounce her, Angelo or Angelo, who says, uh, and uh, you know, it's always repeated that you come as one and stand as many or stand as 10,000. It's good. I'm here not because of what I know or, you know, the, anything like that. We Pacific cultures, we really respect our elderly, our, our founding uh, founders of our nation. So I, I stand on the shoulders of our, our you know, uh, our founders, uh, when I, I say these things and when I quote the uh, uh, wisdom they embedded in our constitution. But there is strength in numbers, you know, that's very important. Our Pacific Islands Forum demonstrated by the, uh, you know, 51st Pacific Islands Forum leaders meeting in Suva recently, which I referred to when I opened this meeting. We adopted the, the communique that I, I talked about. Uh, which adopted the, uh, the 2050 strategy for the uh, Blue Pacific Continent. And the threats of fragmentation, you read some of that, right? Micronesia threatened to, uh, to leave the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, was referred to in Congresswoman's uh, 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 opening. And, and that was a serious one. You know, if I were to represent our country and I'm really true that what I'm doing, I'm not just gonna say and sugarcoat something we're not happy with because Micronesia felt like we were not uh, uh, quite uh, involved 
in the leadership decision making of uh, the Pacific Islands Forum, there is not equity in representation. <clears throat> so it led to the five Micronesian countries threatening to, to leave the Pacific Islands mm -hmm. Forum, but the wisdom of uh, Pacific leaders got us together again, and we negotiated a deal which resulted in the uh, Suva Agreement. And the Suva Agreement is really beautiful because, uh, you know, it instituted legally binding reforms uh, under the Suva Agreement to include selection and sub-regional rotation of the Secretary General position and uh, hosting of the sub-regional office of the Forum in Micronesia, hosting of the office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner in Micronesia, and filling of the uh, head of this office by Micronesia or in Micronesia. So we are implementing these reforms in good faith to strengthen unity among the Pacific nations as one family. And you know, the thing I felt about it, uh, I walked out of the meeting not because I didn't love my Pacific brothers and sisters, but if we had not, uh, had we not uh, resolved that very sensitive issue, our Pacific Islands Forum has the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the danger of being fractured and if we were to be fractured, imagine the Pacific working in isolation. No man is an island, right? And so what I felt from, from the Suba Agreement, which was instituted in the structure of the reforms of the Pacific Islands Forum, it really uh, solidified our sense of regionalism and unity that would never, ever be fractured again. So when we came together in Fiji, uh, recently, you know, we had one too many hugs because we've been doing virtual meetings just during the two and a half year lockdown. And finally we met. And so I could uh, up the PG prime minister as chair of our forum. And when we negotiated, I tell you, uh, it, had it not been in person, our country, our, our region would have uh, fallen apart under the umbrella of the Pacific Islands Forum. Meeting in person really what we call the Talanoa process, the Pacific way uh, really matters. You cannot achieve that through a, a virtual meeting. So it was, this, it was the 11th hour, few days before the deadline that will reach our legal sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, technicalities and the legal uh, of our membership in the forum. A few days left when a call came in and Australia was preparing a plane to shuttle Micronesian leaders to go meet with Fiji Prime Minister to resolve at the 11th hour. I was in quarantine. I had not met my mother, my kids, and then I had to leave again, you know. So <laughs> those are the things that are called under, you know, tough times. And as I said, if I don't go, you know, we risk uh, fragmenting the Pacific Islands uh, region. Uh, and so I went, and Palau President and I went on behalf of the sub region, and we, you know, the rest is history. We signed the SUVA agreement with the reforms that were, uh, were agreed to. And then when we met after that, uh, we felt like really one big family with strong uh, sense of the cohesion. <clears throat> one other matter that is important to our region is, uh, uh, I think, the uh, very serious threat of the Blue Pacific continent with the potential nuclear contamination of health and security of the Blue Pacific. And that is the Japan's decision to release uh, nuclear contaminated water known as HALPS and, uh, you know, advanced liquid processing system treated water from the Fukushima Taiichi nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. And that they're announcing to be done in March and April and next year uh, must be fully informed by science. And so, you know, our few, we came to the UN and we, we met with the Secretary General, the Pacific Island Nations, uh, spoke on maritime security and all of that. And as a leader, I just could not allow in good conscience for this to happen. So we're working together as a bloc uh, to send high level delegation to the Prime Minister of uh, Japan, advocated at the highest level at the UN and elsewhere. And so we look forward to resolving this because, you know, the Pacific Ocean is where our, our livelihood comes from. We are the ocean, you know, in, in uh, uh, many ways that I can put it. And if we contaminate the marine life, and we supply the rest of the world, by the way, with the uh, marine products, uh, main, uh, especially uh, the tuna stocks, the main markets is where we, we supply 
in Japan, in the United States, the sushi places you go to mostly are coming from the blue Pacific continent. And so would you support something like that if it's not clear cut safe? Uh, we, we need to be informed because it threatens our food security, not just the Pacific, but the global community. So as a region, we affirm our determination for a, a region free of environmental pollution by radioactive waste and other radioactive matter as expressed in the, uh, you know, you've heard about it, the South, South Pacific Nu Nuclear Free Zone Treaty, uh, or otherwise known as the Rarotonga Treaty. So that's uh, really uh, something that we want to stand by strongly. I was working at the United Nations when we uh, filed in the uh, International Court of Justice to stop the, you know, the testing by the uh, French uh, government in Mororoa. French Polynesia, we stop that because if you apply the, uh, you know, the, the provisions of the Biodiversity Convention, even if you're a neighbor, nobody has a right to contaminate your, uh, your, your neighboring ocean uh, because it's a transboundary issue and it's intergenerational issue when you talk about radioactive, uh, you know, uh, uh, waste and uh, acid and contamination. And so, <clears throat> you know, I know I should conclude that the role of the U.S. in the regional security is uh, important. U.S. is a, a close ally of our Pacific Island nations, especially the freely associated states. So the U.S. Uh, considered FSM, as I said, as part of the homeland, and uh, we consider ourselves as part of the homeland. You know, I met the Hawaii governor during the COVID there, uh, and he said, hey, President, did you know that you received the vaccine before the state of Hawaii? I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you see how fast that travels to our, when we need it the most. We received vaccines before Hawaii did, and we were getting the same information that President uh, you know, Trump at the time was getting. Uh, in terms of uh, information coming out of CDC. And so you see that when we say we're part of the homeland, so if any attack happens to our country because of or by virtue of our treaty with the US, it's gonna be considered attack on the United States. Now, now this is something through the treaty, but you know, sometimes it worries me when, when you know, the Ukraine war happened and, and NATO couldn't really go in, you know, I got to <laughs> wrap it around my head, first of all, to see why we're unable to do. But I think we know your students with the mature thinking to kind of extrapolate these issues because of the threat. I mean, I was going to give our speech at the UN. And as I was walking out to go down to deliver my speech, I, I saw Plinken a uh, meeting of the Security Council to, to implore uh, Russia to stop the you know, threat of nuclear war. And so you know why that's very important, because if you do too much in terms of that, who knows what these regimes could do? And it's going to, you know, annihilate. It's a, not a win-win situation. Eh? It's a no-win situation when nuclear war happens and, and all of that. And so a few things, and I'll close. You know, the elements of our treaty with the United States, uh, it has what is called a you know, the FSM or our nation, maybe it's not happened in the past with other countries or too many times, but we delegated the, uh, some of the responsibilities of defense to the United States under our constitution. And when we were a young nation seeking diplomatic ties with countries around the world, when we were uh, just a territory, some of the uh, big countries question our, our sovereignty because they say, hey, you, United States, you know, they look after your, your defense. But we say under inter international law, a nation as small as we are can delegate our uh, defense responsibilities to the United States. And that happened, I believe, under the uh, Reagan administration when we signed that treaty in 1986. Our former ambassador, our late ambassador, signed with the, the Reagan. And then we went away, realized that the document was not quite complete. So we came back. I think the Secretary of State at the time was uh, George Schultz. And we said, we cannot uh, live with this document. We gotta uh, make our nations at the equal level. So we amended that to give the conduct of foreign affairs to be fair and the US to treat us as a sovereign nation under the Vienna Convention on uh, you know, Diplomatic and Consular Relations. Because we were just a liaison office, believe it or not, at the time. So I stand here on the shoulders of our founding fathers because had it not been for their foresight, and their, their wisdom, 
I could not be standing here as president of our country. I might be, you know, going around as a territory of the United, United States. But then the United States is also a very uh, progressive nation when they see that the aspirations of countries wants to become independent. They don't pluck it. They also allow it, right? Uh, because of the uh, uh, U.S. is a champion of democracy. Uh, and, and see, it's working out really better for the United States today. Because if they had territories, they won't have nations with patriotism like ours, which feels that the United States is the closest ally, uh, and we're equals at the United Nations, uh, no matter our population, uh, so small. So we can help U.S. as a true partner when we are a sovereign nation like we are today, and like Palau, <clears throat> like the Republic of Palau and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. So I will close here because I'm not sure I have several more pages but <laughs> <laughs> to, to decipher a few things. But why don't I just say we can be interactive if I run out of my time, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Allen, and then maybe I can cover some of these uh, things that I've not uh, covered here. Uh, I think my staff will be not so happy with me that I have not exhausted <laughs> some of what I should be discussing. But why don't we call it that way? Uh, I'm not sure how much time I've, uh, I've uh, taken. Uh, my 20 minutes have surely been exhausted, right? <laughs> but, but you know, uh, uh, the point is that as a global community, all of us would have to champion democracy, uh, you know, uh, preserve the rules-based international law. I think that's what's very important. The world cannot be peaceful without these things. We worry about the escalation of uh, U.S. and China over Taiwan, you know, uh, the, the landscape out there. We have a one China policy that we uh, uh, to look at here. U.S. has a one China policy. Uh, they kind of defend the ambiguity, uh, whatever position policy they have. But sometimes they 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 try to push the envelope sometimes and they walk it back. It's a sensitive issue because we're dealing with superpowers. And, and you know, as uh, nations, we have to be responsible nations in uh, conducting our uh, you know. Uh, what we do as nations to build uh, uh, friends around the world. So may I wish all of you, uh, students, uh, uh, best of luck, because uh, even few of you, when you go back, like students who go back to our country, uh, you really make an impact on the nation building process. And you are future leaders of, uh, you know, you are mostly United States citizens, uh, uh, leaders of this country. And you know, I'll close by this uh, funny story. When I was eighth grade, uh, because I want to, I want to share how students today are so much more advanced than in my days when I was going to school. Uh, I was coming into high school, and I still have a broken English because we didn't teach English in our schools at the primary level. So one day, you know, one guy, his name is Dave Romero. <laughs> I'm not sure why I can't remember this man, but. He, he came in with his father, who was an engineer, uh, to do projects on sewer lines and all of that, you know, in the uh, days. And then every time I meet him, uh, you know, I would say, hey, Dave, where you go? And, you know, hey, Dave, where you go? Because my, my English was very limited, you know. I was about entering uh, high school. <clears throat> and then one day he really stopped me and said, hey, come here. What do you mean by Dave, where you go? Do you mean... Dave, where have you been or where are you going, you know? And you know how it is that you, you learn because, and then I came out to school at Eastern Oregon uh, to, to really give you how, how it is with my reality is that I struggled my first and second quarters to the point where I said, man, I'm not gonna return to my country and fail because I've been expelled from school. And you know that the fire inside me, I would visit the libraries and read and take up so many things. And then, you know, by the time I was in uh, uh, senior, you know, I was uh, really proud of myself for doing uh, uh, grades like A pluses and all of that. And I took a career choice uh, uh, class. And one of the uh, professors, which is a mentor, was trying to gauge what we were interested in. And then, found out that I was really interested in, uh, you know, political science, international relations. And so I congratulate, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Didwell here, Helen, and your entire institution for producing uh, fine uh, students that will be out there to help 
and make our world a, a better place to be a harmonious and a peaceful place like the Pacific Island countries. So in my language, Kalang, and thank you all uh, for allowing me the opportunity to share these uh, few you know, issues that we try to uh, work with as leaders, uh, working with other nations to make our world a peaceful and uh, you know, harmonious uh, world to live in. Thank you, and I look forward to some interactive. Uh, Well, President Pandola, thank you very much for that wonderful, uh, wonderful discussion. And uh, uh, I promised you that there wouldn't be a quiz, so no, no, no quizzes. But, but, but you, so here you are in Washington, and you're being joined by a host of other Pacific Island leaders, as you noted. And this is a, the first of the first meeting of its kind. Yes. But I'd be curious to know, in thinking about this meeting, what would be a success when you go home at the end of this meeting? What will have to happen for you to think that, wow, that was a success, that, that we really yeah. hit the ball right? You know, that's a loaded question because in the world of uh, politics, it's so fluid, right? But then fortunately, uh, we Pacific Island nations, we, we really know what we want. Uh, you know, we begin with the bigger threshold of uh, harmony and peace. That's important to set the stage the environment because if there's none of that, who could thrive under, you know, uh, a, 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 an environment that's not peaceful. And so when we come here uh, with the marathon of meetings, uh, you know, from our uh, homes and then coming to Hawaii and then to United Nations and then here, the capital of uh, most uh, powerful nation in the world, you know, it, it's a, a, an elation to know that uh, President Biden has, uh, you know, seen the foresight to invite the Pacific leaders here to engage each other. Now we're going to come out with a declaration, uh, a vision statement, and we've been at it, I tell you, you know, <laughs> it starts from zero traffic and our uh, Pacific have been going back and forth. And in any negotiation, there are, you know, red lines, you know, and then there are things you give and take and you reach some common ground. And it's going to deal with the thematic areas that are probably five, you know, human-centered development, tackling climate change, you know, uh, geopolitics, security of the Pacific region and the global uh, community as well. Uh, we're going to deal with commerce and industry. We're going to deal with the uh, trade ties that you can think of, among other issues that we have. So I think the most important thing is that United States has uh, re-engaged the Pacific, you know, in, in big ways than, than we've seen in the recent past. Uh, when we were in, uh, in uh, Suva for the Pacific Island Leaders Meeting, uh, Kamala Harris uh, addressed the uh, Pacific Island countries to announce uh, a much increased uh, uh, level of their, uh, our, uh, what is called the fisheries uh, tuna treaty with the United States. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, they've uh, expressed in terms of human-centered development, the uh, return of Peace Corps into the region. Uh, climate change assistance in that area that I believe will be implemented under the USAID. And then, uh, you know, among other things that we're looking at, uh, they've announced for the first time that uh, the United States will uh, uh, appoint a special envoy to the Pacific Islands Forum. And I think that's very important because when U.S. is far away from us, they need to have someone that's dedicated to our premier political organization to hear the heartbeat and you know the, the, the everything that matters to us, the, the you know subtleties of our culture, the way we do things, and I, that that is already a success, you know, in my view, because when people are engaging each other, nations are engaging each other, uh, you will see some success out of that. And so we have the big issue of climate change that we're really doing the Green Climate Fund. I've said it's like pulling teeth because they've announced big amounts of money, but when you access it with small capacities, it takes you years to, to pull money. And when you get it, and then <laughs> the bureaucracy, you know, I was just uh, being briefed by uh, Tamara, who's with our uh, Micronesian Conservation Trust that our South Pacific, it's called SPREP, our main environmental regional organization. It cost them 300,000 or more to implement these things under the Green Climate Fund. It's supposed to money, be money coming to us to help with adaptation, mitigation, and all the rest of the things we're doing with, with the climate. But it costs us money because of the bureaucracy, and we're asking 
that some of these are streamlined so that you know we don't have to deal with it because our Pacific nations have small capacities to to do uh, this kind of work. And so I think and and but on that note. For the freely associated states, uh, we are negotiating our treaties with the U.S. on the expiring provisions of the compact, and that's going to be a big success as we see it. But then we're not quite there yet. Our our presidents are meeting this evening. Uh, our ambassadors have uh, also written uh, letters to uh, uh, those who are negotiating with us to try as much as possible to reach some common ground that can reflect, you know, what what our issues in terms of development issues, because we also provide that uh, we play a big role in the uh, overall uh, strategic, uh, you know, Pacific that we have because of the, uh, what I probably didn't touch in there, uh, some of the, what is called the veto denial rights under the treaty. Uh, that if the United States see some unfriendly thing in the big expanse of ocean that we have, and you know, it's uh, the contiguous space from Hawaii all the way to the Marshall Islands, to the Federated States of Micronesia, to Palau, and to the bigger Asian countries. That's a big open space that is enjoyed by the United States in terms of providing the strategic importance for the keeping the Indo-Pacific uh, region secure. And so it's not like we're not playing our part. We, we are playing our part in providing that kind of, uh, you know, forward-looking uh, collaboration between the United States and our country. And so, it's uh, we're we're partnering with the U.S. rather than just being a you know a country that is there just uh, merely there. But our sovereignty uh, provides for that and the cooperation that we work with the U.S. on. And to me, it's a it's a big success. But we're not there yet. There are elements of it in any anything we're doing, whether it's for the bigger Pacific region or for the freely associated states. Uh, there is uh, many elements that we need to improve in these things to reach that and call it a success. So I probably didn't answer that, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a big uh, fluid work that we're trying to uh, put in the elements to call it a success. But I think we'll announce uh, those things when, when the outcome is uh, visible or known in the next few days. Actually, it starts tomorrow and then day after tomorrow. So we'll be looking at, uh, I'm sure the media will help, uh, you know, inform as citizens and folks who wish to know the outcome. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Could I open the floor to questions? Please. Yes, hey, how are you? Hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, yeah, President um, uh, Pinello. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Solano. I'm actually an international student from Colombia, from Latin oh, America. Okay, yes. Um, uh, last semester I had the opportunity to actually co-host a podcast with uh, Dr. Alan Titwell, actually in Oceania geopolitics, where we discussed yes. uh, a lot of uh, interesting things about yeah. the current situation of, uh, of, of, of all the South Pacific uh, countries. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, two questions. Sure. The first one uh, has to do with uh, Chuuk's independence. Um, Chuuk, right. The, right. right, like uh, for a couple of years, the yeah. referendum has been postponed. <laughs> yeah. It has been said mm -hmm. that it's going to probably, you know, uh, the, the topic will actually come again uh, uh, into importance mm -hmm. after the Compact of Free Association is free. Yeah. Negotiated, so I would just like to know what's what what's your opinion on what can happen in your mm -hmm. inaugural uh, discourse in 2019. You said that uh, I'm going to cite yeah. you. It's not that I want us to lose our individual island identities. Mm -hmm. It's that only by recognizing that we're bound together can our can or nation arrive at destination. That's what you yes. said in 2019 yes. <laughs> in your discourse. Um, so I'm wondering what how how how, how you think this will um, evolve in the upcoming yeah. years. And then uh, my second question is just a historical curiosity. I, as a Colombian citizen, come, of course, I'm a result of, uh, I would say, Spanish colonization. Yes. I, yes. And I think we, we historically share a little bit of that mm -hmm. also with uh, Micronesians. Um, there has been a dispute uh, with Spain with uh, Capinga Maringi the <laughs> okay. for a couple of uh, years as well. I was yeah. wondering if the, te you know, the topic of Capinga Maringi had actually uh, died away with time, or is it, mm -hmm. is it something that between Paliquira and Madrid is still uh, being spoken or not. Thank you. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you've you been doing your research for sure. Right? You are students. I was right when I read up about Georgetown, right? <laughs> you're, not just, you're not just playing out there in the yard. You're really studying, and thanks to all of you. And those are very good questions and very uh, involved, you know. The, 
I'm glad you asked about the chuk because not too many people know about that. You know, if you're following our region, you will know about it. And thanks for asking. You know, the, the issue of uh, cessation by, you know, uh, some of the islands of Chuk, and then it became almost all of Chuk state at one point. It started from the Fajuk region. And the Fajuk region within Chuk, by the way, Chuk is the most populous uh, state in our federation. It has more than 50% uh, of, uh, as one state uh, of, of the nation. And so that's why our politics tries to reflect a system that, and you know, our, our founders are very, uh, uh, you know, deep with wisdom or in wisdom, uh, because when they crafted our constitution, the word democracy almost emulates the U.S., uh, you know, democratic uh, form of government, uh, but we have, uh, uh, you know, ways of uh, uh, making it more fit to our purpose. Uh, you're elected as a member of Congress, for example, and going to the and then you have another layer, then Congress, the 14 members, then select who the next president and the next vice president would be. It's not a popular vote. Eh? And, you know, that comes from the fact that Chuk is the most populous. I think if they think about popular vote, one state alone, you see our big flag with the big ocean of one million miles of ocean under the United Nations law of the sea. It gives us that big uh, ocean and we have so many islands. But four islands are there, four shining stars of the states. And so if we're given election by popular vote, it'll be probably one state alone, unless you're more popular that you can, you know, <laughs> get all the, the vote from all the states combined. <clears throat> Fajuk uh, region, uh, that island, which is one of the islands in Chuk, has about 20 some uh, population, 20 some thousand population, which is more populous than two of our other states, you know, and uh, you know how you see that. And so the challenge of economic development is one of the things, you know, we have a federal system of government and the states have more autonomy in deciding what kind of investment goes there because they, they have the land. And so uh, the fact that they feel disenfranchised, you know, that state uh, started, uh, you know, movement way back in history to try to uh, break away as a separate state from Chuk and become, I don't know, five states. And then the movement over the years kind of, uh, got some of the Chuk politicians involved that at one point, and Chuk was trying to uh, threaten the Federation to also pull away, right? You know, but, you know, when I came in and you cited one of my statements in the inauguration, I, I meant it, you know, there are divisions in our country and unity is very important. And if we don't have unity, then it fractures your nation and it's a worry, right? Because you're trying to build a nation. And so at one point uh, when we have difficulties because we don't feel the certain sense of nationalism, uh, because state, you can be, hey, I'm this state, I'm this state, I'm better than you are. We need to get more economic development, more, more resources. And so some of our laws reflect the division of revenue by law, uh, which respects the size of the population. Because if it's not, then you know there's gonna be dispute over and over. And so that uh, part of the region uh, in, in Chuk felt like they are not getting their share of economic development, so they start threatening, uh, pulling a wave. And it's true, the trickle down doesn't really reach them. And you know, we still have rudimentary stuff about transportation, education system, health, not reaching them. As a people, what would you do? You're gonna try to fight for, for it, right? And then do that. And then it reached Chuk State and then almost threatened our country breaking away and all of that. But fortunately, you know, uh, uh, that's dying out, uh, much dying out, uh, more than uh, you will know. Uh, right now, the governor of uh, Chuk is not even paying attention to that issue. I think the Political Status Commission may have expired. I, I don't know those details. And so when I was a president, I mean, part of the, uh, part of the uh, beginning of my administration, when we come through uh, difficult times, when we feel the division, you know, COVID came in, one of the challenges was ship came back, uh, from try talk from the Philippines and one Chukis boy was uh, to, they came they were they were tested negative but when they came into Pompe the capital you know the pressure on me as a president when they say hey, send that ship back to Chuk they're not Pompeians you know like that kind of division it's really a tough one because it involves leaders you know uh, uh, there and, <clears throat> and so certain leaders came to me and say you have to send the ship back to Chuk but it's a national vessel that, vessel that we gave to Chuk to use. So I, I just want to give you some of the dynamics. And then I had to stand up and say, no, 
I'm not going to send the, the, the vessel to Chuk. This is our citizen and this is the vessel for the nation. And I will not do that. And then, then they come around and say, oh, you have a very huge responsibility, Mr. President, to keep us united. So I always say before, you know, we are Micronesians before we are Chukis, before we are Pohnpeians, Yapis, or Koshayans. And these are the four states. Because in fact, you know, we need to continue to build that sense of uh, unity. And so your question on, on that uh, cessation is uh, dying out. And I really hope that it would, because nation building takes a long time, you know, hell of a long time. And I tell you, uh, when they break away, it, it's going to be a, a, a bad thing. They think it's going to be overnight to build a state or to break away. And also our constitution is quite a, a good thing. You cannot just uh, break away. I think you have to earn the votes, and it's so high with the threshold. I think you have to pass a a 75. I, I can't be corrected. Our legal folks are here. A 75 percent on the voting, on the threshold of the total population in three of the four states to make that happen. But I could be wrong. We recently held a, a constitutional convention, which is called by our constitution. Every 10 years, we have to do a constitutional convention to look at how we. Uh, proposed constitutional amendments by the you know delegates and so now we have uh, eight uh, proposed amendments that will put it to vote uh, you know in july and nobody seemed to be looking at uh, a way of loosening our federation as a matter of fact uh, i i like to tighten the bowls in terms of cessation <laughs> so that none of that happens because building a nation i was young college graduate came out and i started my career and I tell you, I fought hard for it, even when I was a college graduate being uh, inducted as a foreign service officer. And when we uh, earned the respect of British government, who was legalistic about our, our position, our, our status, saying, hey, you're not independent. But when we achieved it, I remember jumping in the air and like really punching out. I said, oh, finally, this, this country is smart enough to recognize our, our, you know, self-determination, you know, as we were. And that was difficult because if they don't recognize you, then you fall back to being a territory, right? We were campaigning like hard at the United Nations and places. So I was young when I started, you know, and then when they sent me as ambassador to Fiji as a young age, you know, when I was flying over Fiji, I said, oh, man, what, what if uh, the leaders uh, put me, uh, you know, up to flying this country and uh, not having enough experience. But I think they, they foresaw that, you know, we were small foreign service and they want to mold uh, one of them to be. And so I started gaining uh, experience in Fiji as our regional embassy to integrate with the region as a new nation and then coming out to the UN and then, you know, so those prepared me <clears throat> for, for the kind of job that I'm in. And so people ask me, is it really a difficult job? I said, you know, it's not really, but the decisions you make is what really, really matters because there are times when you're a president of the nation and we, when you make a decision, you got to make sure you make the right decision, even if it's tough, even when it costs you your political, uh, you know, uh, mileage or, you know, there are times when I made those decisions and I said, I don't care about, you know, being elected or not, but you have to make the decisions because you care for your population and I've gone through that. But what's important is that you don't uh, leave any stone unturned because you have to be very informed. Uh, before you make a decision. I think that's what's important. I forgot your other question. Uh, my second question was Thanks. about, uh, uh, I, I forget the name, the atoll that is in dispute Oh, in Spain. okay, okay. Yes. You know, I might be deficient in that history, but I know Kapingamarang is our kind of one of the southernmost. And at one point, uh, Papua New Guinea were kind of choking when I was in Fiji, saying, hey, that's our atoll, you know, Kapingamarang, because they're like Polynesian. They speak, uh, you know, Polynesian yeah. language. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the ambassador was kind of choking. He said, it's okay, we're going to keep you at uh, that <laughs> island, you know. <laughs> and maybe what I can say now is that we'll invite Spain to jointly uh, come in as an owner of that, uh, you know, co-owner of that island. But Spain has come into our country as one of the colonial uh, powers that have come into our country, the first uh, country and then followed by, uh, by the, you know, Germans and the Spaniards and then to, during World War, Second World War, then the U.S. Uh, came in and then kind of took over. Mm -hmm. So we have a rich history with the, with the present. So even myself, you know, uh, I have uh, German blood. My middle name is Wellpacker. 
and then panuelo you know that sounds spanish, spanish. Yeah. Uh, i need to uh, uh two more history to uh, find out <laughs> you know how how that connects but i may not have answered but i have a person that can help you when it's uh, we're done uh, richard clark and give you some of that our press secretary you uh, to inform you a little bit about that history thank you i think we have time for one more question yeah please Hi, Mr. President. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. You mentioned a bit about the recent like divisions of factions in the region. So I was wondering, um, kind of just from your perspective, if you would yeah. prefer that countries engage more with bilateral relationships or engage with the region as a whole through forums such as like the Step Island Forum. Yeah, you know that's a very good question because we've debated that uh, some somehow during the Pacific Islands Forum recent one. Because you're right, you know, every country retains a right to, to uh, you know, have your relations with any other country and nobody can stop you from doing that. So that's bilateral. We have bilateral relations with many countries, the superpowers, even, uh, you know, the, the smallest countries to the bigger, uh, biggest countries in the region. But when we uh, met at the last Pacific Islands Forum, one of the, the very uh, big questions that we were because never before have we encountered the intensity of geopolitics in our region that we were sort of skirting around the decision as to how do we engage with superpowers as a Pacific Islands Forum. And, you know, that was the friendliest meeting we've ever had after a long time because of the fracture of the forum that we, we took care of it and we became very, you know, intact with solidarity with the Pacific Islands Forum. So we started discussing that, but it wasn't quite complete. But what we understood was that we need to build in the guardrails uh, within the forum so that when we recognize an issue that may impact negatively on the region as a whole, I think we got to bring it to the uh, multilateral forums like the Pacific Islands Forum to deal with it. Because what may impact uh, your nation bilaterally uh, uh, that has uh, repercussions to the bigger Pacific uh, family, you know, uh, will have uh, big issues of security, right? And so I think we agreed we're going to come in and discuss these issues uh, with, with those countries through the uh, multilateral setting of the Pacific Islands Forum. Uh, and I think strength in numbers is very important. I think we've uh, never realized this is important uh, like before because we've never really dealt with these kind of issues in the past. Having known the, the threats of geopolitics, uh, I think it's a Fiji prime minister, our forum chair, who you know said that, which I, I really supported, he said, you know, we're not really interested in your superpower uh, issues that you bring into the region. Look at our issues and be interested in our issues. And so I say, the bigger countries has to be benevolent hegemons, right? You know, I don't know if, that term defines it, but the point is every country will have to do what's in their best interest, but we call on the superpowers when they come in and talk to the Pacific Island countries that they deal with us uh, on the terms of the issues that are most important to our region. And so when you come together in strength by numbers, you know, that really helps our small island nations with limited capacity to be together and reach consensus before we agree on uh, bigger issues that can impact uh, the peace and harmony of our region. Well, Mr. President, thank you so much for your yeah. time. And, and could you please join me in thanking uh, President Panuelo? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I should be the one thanking all of you. It's my honor and pleasure to be here and be able to say a little bit of our country. And you students are very, uh, you know, uh, you deep in your <laughs> your questions, and I know uh, this institution is, is really preparing you all to get out to the world. And education is a you know nonstop continuing thing in the you know academia in the world out there and work that we do. And so uh, all the best to all of you and uh, Doctor. Thank, thank you and the entire faculty and uh, thank you staff of the institution and Congresswoman. Thank you so much uh, for. I can be sure of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.